This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Presonus, API Audio, Isotope, Sound Porter Mastering, Jay-Z Microphones, and Spectra 1964. And you're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100 Mic Pre, C610 Comp Limiter, and Isotope RX and Ozone. So get ready to rock. I can make a bright room dead, I can have curtains, I can bring in rugs, I can bring in gobos. There's a lot of tricks that are not even particularly difficult. I can have doors that open and shut that give variable acoustics, okay? But it's kind of hard to take a dead room that's way too dead, particularly if it's dead in an uneven manner, and make it bright. What, what are you going to do, bring in 20 pieces of plywood? Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. I've got two words for you that will help you make your best record ever and not lose it. Storage and backup. You want fast drives for composing and recording and reliable drives for backup so you don't lose all your hard work when something goes wrong. That's why I chose OWC Mercury Extreme Pro 6G internal SSDs for my studio computer and Mercury Elite Pro external drives for archiving. Discover the best OWC drive options for your studio at maxsales.com slash rockstars. The Spectra 1964 STX100 Mic Pre provides unequaled headroom and linear output regardless of transient audio peaks, capturing critical details from your microphone. The 100 series amplifiers were used by Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, and The Record Plant on records by ZZ Top, Aerosmith, and John Lennon. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio at spectra1964.com or call them at 801-797-0642. Studio One from PreSonus is the ideal DAW for your home studio, taking you from songwriting all the way through mixing and mastering with a full suite of virtual instruments, guitar amps, and plugins for creative inspiration. It's easy to use for the beginner, yet fully customizable for your high-speed workflow as you become an expert. Get started now with Studio One Artist and PreSonus Sphere for access to all software, learning, and creative collaboration at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is John Storick, registered architect and acoustician. He's a founding partner of WSDG, Walter's Storick Design Group. He's provided design and construction supervision services for the professional audio and video recording community since the 1969 design of Jimi Hendrix's Electric Lady Studios in New York City. John Storick received his architectural studies from Princeton and Columbia Universities. As an independent designer, engineer, and principal designer of WSDG, he has been responsible for over 3,500 world-class audio video production facilities, including studios, radio stations, video suites, entertainment clubs, and theaters. His work includes private studios for artists like Whitney Houston, Bob Marley, Ace Frehley, Taylor Dane's producer Rick Wake, Johnny Yuma recording in LA, Greenway, CNC Music's Robert Clavicles, Oven Studios for Alicia Keys, and Rock the Mic for Jay-Z and others. Professional audio video installations include Sound Shop in Nashville, Crawford Post in Atlanta, Talking House in San Francisco, Screening Rooms for New York City's Planet Hollywood and Technicolor, Conference facilities for Mercury of Polygram, EMI, Semex, Sumitoma. Large-scale educational and performance facilities for Full Sail, Platinum Post in Orlando, Expression Center in New York, and Jazz at Lincoln Center in New York also. He's also a member of the American Institute of Architects, Acoustical Society of America, Audio Engineering Society, and a frequent contributor to the AES Convention Papers and Professional Industry Periodicals. John's also a frequent lecturer at schools throughout the nation. 
and he has established courses in acoustics at both Full Sail and Expression Center for the Media Arts and is an adjunct professor of acoustics and studio design at Berklee College of Music in Boston, where I'm from. As an architect turned music producer myself, I feel very honored to have John with us today on the show to see what we can learn about studio design and the many ways that it can help us make better records. So please welcome John Stork to Recording Studio Rockstars. John, welcome to the show. Are you ready to rock? You bet. That's a mouthful. It I is guess. indeed. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't I haven't read that in a while. Which <laughs> reminds me, I have to update that a little bit. But it's all right. You wouldn't be the first to feel that way. Um, <laughs> it's just a pleasure to be able to kind of describe yeah. this incredible history and career path that you've had. And uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. If you want to, in you, you know, and briefly in your own words, um, do you want to give us an outline of your, uh, you know, the, the the arc of your career path? starting out and uh, getting to this point. I certainly want to tell you, ask you about Electric Lady Studios, and we have a few requests from some of our audience to ask questions about that yeah, as well. Yeah, we're going to have to. Yeah, it's sort of uh, the gift that keeps giving. I mean, it's it was my first major studio. Actually, it was my first studio, period. One And more or less my first project. I was 22 years old, so you can't wow. do too much before 22 if you go to college. And um, so career tip. Make your first project famous. That's the career tip. <laughs> Let's get that over with. Um, and, and we can come back and, and, and talk about that. But that, that project, um, I guess, triggered a, a life that basically has more or less, basically has been somewhat uninterrupted. A few little speed bumps along the way, um, some associated with some false marriage starts. Um, Happily married for the last 30 years. That's the Walters, by the way. Walters. That's Stork. right. Walters is Beth Walters, my partner in just about everything for 33 years. Uh, children, homes, a life, a business. Uh, she's an interior designer and a fashion designer. And, you know, be, before I met her, a lot of my projects didn't have as much color as they now have. That has a lot to do with her. Nice, nice. Um, the... Um, but but with very little exception, this this path unfolded itself for me. Um, but it was anything but planned. I my favorite. I have a few favorite words. Um, might be good to get that out of the way. My my two favorites, or in not in any particular order, is serendipity is one, and the Spanish word ojalá, which actually comes from the Arabic ojalá, which in Spanish sort of means. Oh, that it would be, or oh my gosh, it would be. You, it's a kind of a funny word how you use it. Um, and uh, I, I live in Mexico about a third of the year. Speaking of Spanish, to get to get arrested, and um, I'm constantly using that. And life just has has just unfolded for me in a in a in a very blessed way. I'm very fortunate. I I I, I remind myself of that all the time. Um, when Electric Lady Studios arrived in my life as a, as a commission, um, I actually truly thought I was going to be a musician. I was in a blues band. I was making clearly more money in a blues band than as an architect. I was also an architect by day. I studied architecture at school. Wow. My music career was continuing after graduating in 68. And I just loved both, pa both, both paths. I was studied piano since I was eight. I was a pretty good clarinet player, actually a very good clarinet player. I became a sax player, keyboard player. What was but, your instrument? Is it guitar? No, keyboards and sax. Keyboards and sax, right? Yeah. On. And all throughout college was played keyboards and sax, more sax when I got into a blues band. And, um, but since I was 11, at least, because I, I know this because I, I did a little paper on it, I always wanted to be an architect. I've loved buildings. I, so, these two paths just continued to be in my life. I went to college, studied architecture, but still was in a band and graduated. And, and now comes the sort of uh, serendipitous moment that's been pretty well documented. I, I hate going over it again, but... <laughs> that's right. You don't uh, have to but, go too deep into it. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those stumbling moments um, in New York in the summer of 68. And if you kind of just imagine what the summer of 68 was like in New York... Well, I was about two years old, and I was living on Staten Island. 
Okay, but you've read about it. And in fact, everything that you read about it from Max's Kansas City to clubs to the Fillmore was in fact exactly what was happening. There were really super exciting times. I left, graduate from Princeton and I move into New York with my then first wife and we have a we have the time of our life. I'm working in the day, money's not an issue, I'm playing music at night. And uh, one evening, as sort of uh, going out for some ice cream and waiting online for the ice cream, Today, of course, you'd be hitting your cell phone and texting and TikToking and doing whatever you're doing. But of course, in 68, that's not what you did. So what, what you did do was you sort of grabbed the East Village Other or the Village Voice and you read the want ads. You just looked at the paper while you were waiting. And there was an ad that called for carpenters to work for free on an experimental nightclub. And I said, well, that sounds like fun. And I dialed the number, rotary phone, 10 cents. <laughs> And 30 minutes later, find myself on the Upper West Side meeting these two pretty crazy people with this little shoebox model of this kind of very bizarre sensorium experimental club that they want to try to build in Soho, which I didn't even know where it was. And we need people to build it for free because we only have $10,000 in a loft. I've right. never even been in a loft. And so... I, one thing leads to another, and I said, you know, I'll, I'll do this at night. This is fun if you let me redesign the club, which I did. By November, it's open. By February, it's on the cover of Life magazine, and life changes almost overnight for me in two months. Um, everybody who's anybody goes to this club. It was one of the most unusual places to go. If you visited New York, you went to the club. It's called Cerebrum. It only stayed open for nine months. Um, all of a sudden, I was kind of thrust into a, a different circle of artists and musicians. And uh, one night, Jimi Hendrix went. And at the time, was taking over, his manager decided to take over the lease of the generation, which was a blues club on 8th Street. You can connect the dots now. It's going to become Electric Lady Studios. Why? Because he used to go there so much. I think he had a big barbell, to tell you the truth. So they bought the lease, not the building, but the lease to take over the club and transform it into his private club. Nice. And um, he turns to his manager and says, find the guy that did this very strange club downtown. And I, I want to have whoever did that. I want that look in my club. And I literally got a call and how they found me from his management company, went up to have a meeting, had the meeting. I'm again, I'm 22 years old. <laughs> and, um, basically get hired to do his club. Wow. Um, I'm pretty sure of the dates because I actually have a drawing. The only drawing I have, April 1969. It's over 50 years old, hand-drawn for the club, which had curves and circles and curved walls and everything was white with changing lights, which was the nature of this club. If you want to know how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of recording studio rock stars, well, I've been cheating all along by using Isotope RX and Ozone on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX D Click. D-clip, D-S, D-plosive, voice denoise, ozone multiband compression, EQ, and limiting on my voice. If you want great consistent mixes too, go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off. Have you ever struggled to finish a mix wondering if it was truly ready for mastering? Wouldn't it be great to have a trusted coach walk you through the final stages of mixing so that you could confidently deliver your mix for professional mastering knowing that it was just right? At soundquarter.com, home of the iterative mastering process, Brian Murphy is your trusted coach to listen to your needs and help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo at soundquarter.com. Right. Well, you said your, your designs got more colorful more recently with your, your wife. Well, at the time, the idea was that it was that the lighting would change the color, which is what was happening at this experimental nightclub. It was more of a think of it less of a club and more of a stage. Yeah. Very strange. You can read up, read up on this club. It's been talked about for years and there's been many books and exhibits on it. So this was fun until all of a sudden 
I got a call saying the project is off because his producer, engineer, Eddie Kramer, as in the Eddie Kramer, has now convinced Jimmy and his manager, Michael Jeffrey, that they shouldn't really build a club. Eddie didn't want to have anything to do with the club. The club even called for a little control room to record musicians on the stage, which I'm not even sure if anybody even really knew how to do in 1969. Of course, now it's easy. Me, I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. So we had a little room that said control room. I, I had no idea what that was. And he talks, reminds Jimmy that he's running up hundreds of thousands of dollars of recording bills. And you should not have a club. You should have a studio. The club is scrapped. My project gets thrown away and I want to strangle Eddie. Uh, <laughs> News flash, Eddie's a lifetime friend and my daughter's godfather. Because on the spot, they just said, well, you could stay on and do the studio. I said, guys, I've, I've never been in a studio. I, I don't really know too much about recording studios. They said, that's okay. Take a month. Try to learn everything you can learn. Tour all the studios in New York, all six of them. And I went back to Columbia University for a crash course, read as much as I could, quit my job, uh, created my own internship with another acoustician who knew a lot about isolation for radio stations. And somehow a year and three months later, drawing by myself at night and then full time during the day, we designed and built Electric Lady Studios, which opened Basically, 50 years ago, the party is, is up in, in two weeks. It's celebrating its 50th anniversary in two weeks. Wow. It was, it was August 1970. So between April and May of 69 and August of 70, I, I more or less went over to 8th Street every single day and supervised the building of this drawing on the spot sometimes. And we got it open. And I would say 50% of what's there now is, is still there for 50 years. It's the same. The A room is still there. It hasn't really changed ever. Were there a couple of details that became known as favorite features of Electric Lady? Well, yes. I, I, I think the ceiling of Studio A is, is kind of the iconic uh, moment. This, and the ceiling is what is doing the work. I mean, the, the sound of Studio A, which is, I guess, somewhere between iconic and legendary. I, I don't believe in legends very much, but it is a good sound. But it wasn't for 25 years that I, until I could measure it, until I even understood how to measure it, so we even had tools that could measure it, that I understood why it worked. And to be honest, it was a little bit of intuition and a little bit of good luck and some accident. We basically, it was a kind of a flat curved propeller shape that was made, still is, out of air in train, very lightweight plaster, which I specified because I didn't want to have a flutter echo between that and the wood floor. But inadvertently, what, what I ended up making, what we ended up designing was a membrane absorber. And that's what's holding in the low frequency. That's what makes that tight sound in that rock and roll music room. Wow. And, that, and that's the real reason why the room works. Uh, it's not Jimmy's spirit in the walls. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I'm okay with that if that's what you want to believe. It's not Some the water. The the river underneath, there is, a, there is a water problem. It's an old river that does flow. It's more like a water table. And there's pumps 24-7 that keep it out. Uh, people have said that they could every now and then hear a tiny little bit of subway rumble from about 200 feet to the west. I, maybe these things are all true, but I'm telling you it's the ceiling. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and is that ceiling a sealed ceiling or is it no, actually just sealed. like a hanging no, open membrane a, somehow? Kind of a suspended framework. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of as if you took a propeller and just hung it, but flat and it's still there and it's still white with changing lights. Um, many things have, have changed since then. The floor originally was half wood and half carpet because we thought that maybe we wanted to have a deader end after the second flood. The, it, there's been two floods there when the pump stopped. They finally said, we'll just make the floor all wood. It, it turned out that that ceiling was actually quite quite a flutter-free uh, knockout element. So we, it's now all wood. And uh, now control room has changed a number of times. There have been other rooms that have been added upstairs. We did a B studio many years later. There's a C studio that we worked on. There's a few other rooms that we didn't work on. Um, well, it, it brings up an interesting question um, about whether or not, you know, when you talk about sort of the legend of studios and sounds, whether those legends come more often from the live room space in the studio than from the control rooms anyway. That's an interesting, you know what? 
I, I log questions. And I've never heard, because uh, I teach a lot, so I'm always kind of like my, my salary is, can, is a question I've never heard. Uh, to be honest, most questions I've heard before. Yeah. I've never quite, like, hats off to you, by the way. I've never quite heard. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> heard, that's great. I've never quite had that asked in exactly that way. Um, I think the bigger rooms, the music rooms, what I call the iconic classic rooms, like an Abbey Road, like a, the ranch, you know, uh, with Lucas, uh, the um, Capital A, uh, Electric Lady. I think, I think the signatures there are the live rooms. I think people want to work there because they get a sound out of those live rooms that's, um, that is special. Or the live room hooked into their echo chamber, in the case of Capital, is, is special. Um, I think what's happened in control rooms is that people have gotten really, really good at making control rooms really, really good. I mean, I have, but others have too. I, I don't, uh, I believe we're one of the best in the world, but, I be, but, I, but there are others that know how to do it. So I believe, I believe control room accuracy um, is something that as an industry, we, we've gotten pretty good at. Um, doesn't mean that everybody gets it right, but I know we, we get it right. And if you think about it, it's very important that the behavior of the control rooms are somewhat interchangeable because people have been making records in more than one room now for the last 10 and 15 years. I don't have to tell you that, and I'm sure this has been discussed on your show many times. So we need those rooms to translate very nicely to the next room. We need an accurate electric lady A to have a response characteristic, both frequency domain and time domain, that's kind of okay with the mastering room so that when stuff comes out of that and it goes up to gateway, it's gonna translate pretty well. But when it comes in from somebody's home studio, it translates pretty well. Yeah. And so our industry has, has put pressure to make that happen. But, the, but what distinguishes one studio from the next? Okay, and this is my underlying theme for 51 years. I realized that this is basically what I've been doing for 50 years. It's vibe, it's architecture, it's mood, and it's the uniqueness of the recording environment. Okay, particularly in live rooms. Okay, um, but vibe is important. Okay, service is important. Okay, the architecture is important. But in the control rooms, the many, many control rooms are interchangeable now. Interesting, okay. yeah. That, that um, would make a lot of sense. It, it, it has to be that way, okay? You, you almost don't want a control room to be too good because what does that mean, okay? I mean, I can get a control room to have more low-frequency energy. That, that's not hard. But all you're going to do is bring down the low-frequency on your mix or you're not going you're, you're gonna to say, great, I'm okay, and then when you go to a mastering room, it's going to be too low. But you haven't done anything with it because it was artificially in the room. We have this problem with urban studios, with hip hop studios, or urban studios, where the, the owners of the studio, particularly private studios, they just want double 15s. They want 415s. They want 120 hertz pounding away, 120 dB pounding away at 40 hertz. And I'm reminding them that you're, you're going to kid yourself. You're going to think that all that information is there. And when this moves out into another environment, or, or if it even leaves your environment and goes to radio, or it goes to Skype, or it goes to the streaming services, you're going to get ripped off. You heard it in your room, but it's not really there. You would be better to have a room that's accurate across all platforms, okay? And then put on to your mix, put, well, put on to your tape or put on to your file what really should be there. Think about it. This not. I don't think I'm suggesting anything very complicated. No, no, not at all. And and when you're talking about the, um, you know, almost like the standard for control rooms, it reminded me, I think uh, when Michael Cronin was on, he talked about Westlake tr essentially wanting to do that, that same thing. But that was really from studio to studio. And I like your idea of sort of studio to everywhere. I think it has to be everywhere because our industry has changed. And I don't, I don't just mean this C19 moment. The C19 moment is a speed bump, a big one, but, but this will end. But for a long time now, you know, go to the back of, of Taylor Swift's album. It's been made at eight, you know, it was made at eight studios with four producers and seven yeah. songwriters. I, I think I'm actually pretty accurate. 
Okay. And, you know, some of it was made in Jack's house in Brooklyn and some of it was made in her house in Los Angeles. And then it was mixed somewhere else and it was mastered somewhere else. You, there's an understanding that these rooms can talk to each other at a control room level. But in the live recording environments, when you want live recording, particularly the bigger rooms, which would have as a signature certain drum sounds, for instance, okay, you're, choo- you're often choosing those rooms because of that sound. Because of that sound. That's the reason you're there. Obviously, there are other reasons. Geography, price, equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But so I, that, I'm kind of straddling both sides of the fence on that answer. Yeah, no, anyway, no that's, uh, great. that's great. Electric Lady opens, uh, you know, before it was open, I had three more studios to do. I mean, the word got out. Try and go back to the middle of early 1969. There were no very few independent studios. No, no artists had their own studios. Very few. Beach Boys, maybe. I don't even know if the Beatles had their own studio in 69. And so for somebody like Jimmy, it, it would take an artist like Jimmy to do it. You'd have to have the wherewithal. You'd have to have the money. You'd have to be able to go like to put your hand up to the record company and say, you know, I'm going to deliver my record. I'll pay for it. You can give me an advance, but I'll deliver it when I'm done. So what was the record company going to do? It's Jimi Hendrix. And so the, the irony of it is that Electric Lady, now one of our iconic commercial studios, was built as a project studio. It's a project studio. It was, <laughs> Jimmy didn't anticipate dying. He anticipated right, right. using it forever. But we built it to commercial specs, wisely so, because of his manager, who was very shrewd and very sharp, knowing that there would be times when Jimmy wouldn't be using it. First of all, we built two rooms, okay? And he would go on the road. And so they wanted to have a legal studio that could be rented. But there were no studios south of 14th Street. I don't even know if there were maybe no studios south of 14th Street. This is in the village. Nobody built a recording studio in the village. 8th Street. Now, the irony, so I can wrap this story up so we can move on to whatever you want to move on to, that serendipity moment or the ohala moment, okay, all through college, I'm studying architecture and my, my three iconic favorite architects, okay, were Frank Lloyd Wright, still to this day, somebody who I admire and I'm in awe of and up into many of his buildings. That's someone you know of. And Tony, Antonio Gaudi, the Barcelonian architect who built the Sagrada Familia, and I'm sure you've heard of him. I know him, yeah. He's fantastic. But you might not have heard of Frederick Kiesler. Okay, so Frederick Kiesler basically designed two buildings. And one when he was young, he designed a film theater on 8th Street. I think you're going to connect the dots here pretty quick. In 1927, for the New York Film Guild, as a young man arriving in America from Vienna, I don't know how he got the gig. And then he basically didn't do anything until he was almost at the end of his life in the early 60s when he designed, and this is a building you might have seen, the Dead Sea Scrolls Museum. And if you type in Dead Sea Scrolls Museum right now while you're talking to me, you will see that it's an onion-shaped kind of very strange building, which I was in awe of. I knew of the theater but I had never been in it. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know where it was. I just knew that it knew the pictures. Little did I know that the basement of that movie theater was the the blues club, (laughs) which I went to all the time because I was in a blues band. So how ironic that these paths cross each other and intertwine. And I'm spending a year of my life in his building and not even realizing it until I was about halfway through when I finally connected the dots myself. Wow. Uh, it remained a movie theater up until the nineties. Um, and then it was demolished by the then building owner, electric lady never bought the building. And, um, uh, they, they leveled it and they, I, I think there's like a health clinic there now or something, but the basement is of course still the studio and the rest of the building is, is electric lady studios. They have about, Three or four different smaller rooms. Very, very cool. Simple. Yeah. And well, thank, uh, thank you for retelling the story. You know, I'm sure you've had to do that numerous times. Well, I try to not do it too much. But anyway, the career started and it, I guess it's taken me on this kind of long and winding road. <laughs> 
API Audio has been designing mic pre's, compressors, and EQs for more than 50 years. Every product they make includes founder Saul Walker's original proprietary op amps and transformer designs to make sure you always get that legendary API sound in your studio. Whether you are writing songs for fun or mixing Grammy-winning hits, API has got you covered with individual modules, rack units, and dedicated consoles to make sure your next record is your very best. Go to apiaudio.com. Sometimes you just need a mic that will stand out in a mix. That's when you need the new BB29 Signature Series from Jay-Z Microphones. The unique single diaphragm golden drop capsule gives the BB29 airy highs and smooth mid-range to help your track stand at the front of your mix. Jay-Z's handcrafted, fully discreet microphones come with a five-year warranty and free shipping to the US. You're hearing my voice on the BB29 right now. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jzmike.com. I don't know if you get asked this question uh, at all, but while we can understand this idea of consistency in control rooms and studios, um, I know that that uh, um, uh, your your design group WSDG is uh, you guys have offices everywhere. How important is any unity of office space for architectural design for studios when you guys have spaces all well, over? Well, the, the of course. As my life unfolded, I it was just me, and I had a small office in New York, and then I got a draftsman, and then I got two draftsmen, and um, and and up until maybe thirty oh thir basically right around when I met Beth. I mean, everything changed when I met Beth, which is now thirty three years ago. Uh, you can do the math on that. Um, I had an office. I had one little hiccup in Colorado for a few years, but I always had an office in New York uh, and for many years on Union, on Union Square, which is 14th Street. And then life changed. And, and, but I, I had also been teaching. I had been teaching at Full Sail. I designed Full Sail. And, and so I, I started, we, we started an intern program because Basically, I created my own internship. That's how I actually learned to do the detailing for Electric Lady. I also went to a school that essentially practiced a, a kind of Socratic method of, of, um, of uh, small, uh, you know, you'd go to lectures, but then you'd have small meetings with teachers, sort of like an Oxford model. So, and, that, and that was the model that I was learning on. And of course, as an architecture student, you were always in a studio. You, you didn't go to big lectures. You were in studios. Oh, you yeah. Know that. Yep. They call so, it the building with the, where the lights are always on. The lights were on 24-7. You always do. You always knew. If you if you were never on the campus, you knew which building was the architecture building. Absolutely. Exactly. Still to this day. And um, and so we, I, I, I don't know, one, I think we, our first sort of intern event was we got invited to give a talk in South America. And we kind of went down there on a hunch on it and... The, the, the translator wasn't doing a good job, so the promoter assigned this kid to be the translator, and he had a small studio, and before we left, he was representing me in Argentina, and the next thing you know, we had an office in Argentina. And right. my two of the best students that ever came out of Full Sail applied for and became interns. We have a three-month intern program. We've always had a three-month intern. We, we always have two interns. This is many years ago. And... Within weeks, I wanted to hire them because they were really, really smart kids. And they both said, "We, this is all we want to do. This is what we want to do. One's a Grammy Award-winning engineer and the other's a PhD in physics. They were top students at Full Sail. Um, fantastic accus accus acquisitions. But they wanted to return to their native countries. So one is from Belo Horizonte in Brazil and the other is from Basel, Switzerland. So, again, making a rather long story short, I said, well, we'll just set up offices in those countries. And, and that is essentially what we did. We fronted a little money. They represented us. And then they hired people. And now we have real offices in these countries. Um, we now say we then one thing led to another intern returned to Barcelona, where he now represents us in the Middle East because he does a lot of business in the Middle East. Um, the Argentine office moved to Miami because they transplanted themselves. So now the main office is in Miami. 
So that it, I guess my point is, is that I wait, I didn't wake up one day with this plan. I'm, I'm not that smart. Right. I, I believe me, I'm not that smart. It just unfolded. Yeah. It grew organically, which we call it a farm system. So, and the next thing you know, you have 50 to 60 people all over the place that are r- r- working in these individual offices. So now you ask, how do they all talk to each other? We, we all talk to each other. It, it, to, to simplify it, uh, it, it I, I own a piece of each one of these offices. So they're independent, but I own half of them. That's changing, by the way, also, uh, and has started to change. But remember now, this has been going on for 25 years. We're friends. We're family. We've all grown old together. And uh, so the, we have uh, standards that we all adhere to. We have a MOU, Memorandum of Understanding. We have our – but each office – is essentially ascertaining and obtaining their own projects. And then the offices exchange services with each other. So different offices are better at certain things. For instance, the Brazil office and the Miami office have very, very high visualization skills. Okay. The Swiss office do not draw. There are no architects in the Swiss office, but they have four very heavy duty cat models. The Swiss office then went and bought a seven person office in Berlin. So now we have a Berlin office with very heavy acquisitions, no architects. The New York office is probably the lead office for architecture. Okay. Um, But, but a baby acoustics team, although growing. Um, And then we have different reps, but it, it, it explained, we try to not do work in areas where we can't supervise the jobs, either directly because we're there or almost directly because we can get there easily. And people ask us all the time, why aren't you doing studios here? Why aren't you doing studios there? I said, we have, we're oversubscribed. Even in the C-19 era, we're, we're oversubscribed. We have more than enough work. So we, we're careful to just choose projects. By the way, it doesn't mean only big projects. We have small projects. We want to choose them because the the projects are right, the learning curve is high, the clients are right, the money is fair, and we can supervise it because the work that we do requires a lot of supervision. It's it's all detail-oriented. John, John, can I ask you a question? You you listed three things. You you differentiated architect. uh, You said CAT. C-A-T, is that right? Or did you say CAD? CAD CAD is a modeling software that we use. It's an oralization software, and we've gotten pretty good at it. Not as in computer automated design, not CAD. No, that's CAD. That's C-A-D. Okay. And then acoustician. Yeah, we're using CAD programs for 30 years. We we had, everybody uses CAD. The program that we use is called Revit, R-E-V-I-T, but the the acoustic modeling program that we use, there's, there's three major ones piece of information for your team out there. One is called CAT, C-A-T-T. The other is Odeon, spelled like you would imagine. And the other is Ease, um, which is associated with Ezra. A lot of engineers would know that. And um, one of the co-developers of Ease is Wolfgang Arnart, who is in fact the founder of the company we bought in Berlin. But for some reason we use CAT. We, we're a little more comfortable with it. We think it sounds a little bit better. We, of course, are developing our own low-frequency prediction and modeling software, and we'll talk about that later. That's a research project we're on, and that was what our webinar was on last week. Very uh, cool. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a whole other adventure that 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 we're in. But but the offices all talk to each other. It is very common for one project to start in an office, so the business is out of that office, but it involves some projects involve every office. They involve every office. What's the, yeah. what's the deal with uh, the funny parallels between uh, the recording world and the architecture world that I, I think they both started to adopt computers about the same time. So Pro Tools probably yes. showed up about yes. when CADs they did. did. They did. And, they, they did. and what's with the three letters? We, ha- we have to call it a DAW, a D-A-W in the studio, and you uh, got to call it a CAD if you're an architect. Computer-aided drafting or computer-aided <laughs> drawing. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Um, uh, well, I don't know what the Revit, I don't know what Revit stands for. That's uh, funny. Our software is called Niro, and that stands for non-cuboid, non-cuboid, which means rooms that are not rectangles. Yeah. Iterative, which means lots of iterations. Okay. Room optimization. 
Non-cuboid iterative room optimization is the name of our software. More about that later. All right. Yeah. Well, um, so you, you're doing teaching, and uh, of course, you've done just more studio designs than we could ever cover. But um, let me see if I can touch on a couple of questions we had and, and uh, shout outs and um are these questions that, that are coming in or they came in in advance? Or? Well, it's it's more uh, so, for example, we got a little a hello to you from Ross Rice over at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Yeah. And his, well, uh, we, his comment it, was great work there. So we did the studio at RPI. Uh, Mary Simone, who's the, in charge of humanities there, who, OK, was former uh, director of music at University of Michigan. So she's in a friend and our client. And also, I teach at RPI once a year in their acoustics department, which is inside their architecture department. It's only an hour from where I live, so it's it's an easy drive. Oh, cool, cool. I actually, so, I looked at that college. Outside. Yeah. I could have ended up there. Uh, but what uh, anything that you want to talk about as far as what considerations went into the design of a studio for RPI? Well, RPI, as strange as it seems, which is an amazing engineering school, one of the best, and it has a growing humanities program and music program supported by their dean and an acoustics program never had a recording studio. I mean, they, they, they have a new, they have MPAC, which is the new digital performance center. And it, there are some studios there, but they're really more for research. They, they just never had a studio where students could just use it and or be taught. And a lot of students want to use a studio. They want to have recitals. They want to record their work. So Mary got raised the funds for it and they found they they basically were able to kind of grab an old video stage. It was like, a, I guess, what you and I would call an insert stage. I don't know, five or six hundred square foot with a video control room, not shaped particularly well and a few other little rooms. But it was in the basement of one of their humanities buildings and 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 actually pretty well built kind of 50s construction block construction, very heavy. And so we were given that space. We, it's not like we had a blank white piece of paper. And our job was to convert it to a combination audio video studio. So sometimes they're shooting videos, sometimes they're shooting audio, sometimes both. So that was a little bit fussy because part of the programming called for it to be sort of a black box theater, which is dry and dead and basically pipes and curtains. Okay. But musicians don't want to really play in that kind of space. You certainly don't want to see four string players come into a space with all curtains and velvet. That's or four trumpets. They're going to go nuts. So we kind of created a space with variable acoustics, curtains that pocket, um, that then reveal what you and I would think would be more traditional uh, acoustic uh, treatments, perforated wood mostly, the video control room had to get rejiggled around. We built a false wall so that it was now symmetrical. When they, as a video room, they didn't really care if it wasn't symmetrical. Symmetry is, is the single most important characteristic of a control room. Right on. In my opinion. Uh, I could, it doesn't mean you can't have an asymmetric control room, but if you have to choose one and only one characteristic of, a, of an environment, make it symmetrical. And now is that, is that because we're doing dealing with stereo audio? Yeah, stereo. Hello, two ears, symmetrical, easy. Yes, not a, not a hard concept. Now, having said that, there's ten other things you need to do. But again, if you need to just choose one, I got one move. Make it symmetrical, please. <laughs> it's one of those challenges, I think, when you're a studio owner, though, because uh, the music creation isn't particularly symmetrical. And so sometimes you're like, I want to put my guitar there and something else over here. And yeah, yeah I guess that's got to be are, challenging. Ears are and your mixing plane is. And the way you hear music is through a symmetrical listening machine. Notice your headphones. Yeah, that's why it has to be symmetric where you where you place sounds is of course what you're doing that is what you're doing among among many other things yeah that's that's the art and you're absolutely right if you want the vocals to be on the far right hand corner of your of your listening plane then put them there okay but you you don't want the asymmetry of the room particularly smaller rooms okay and as you know rooms are getting smaller obvious reasons expensive real estate more home studios, et cetera, et cetera. So as the rooms get smaller, the boundaries get closer. 
Makes sense. Yeah. Not a difficult concept. And as the boundaries get closer, you now have a higher and higher risk of immediate comb filters. By that, I mean bounces off of a surface that are coming a few feet later or a few milliseconds later. So you have unnatural, you have an unnatural effect that the room is causing you, basically flanging, which is going to get, get, it's a time domain issue, gets translated to the frequency domain and starts making your listening response a natural and, and not true. And then you start making EQ decisions that are really untenable. They're, you're, you're making EQ decisions based on a time domain effect. It's just not really natural. If you move your head a few inches, it's all going to change. Whereas if you were able to get your room symmetrical and were able to have some of those immediate surfaces expand out or deaden them, one or the other, or both, and get into what has been designated as a reflection-free zone or a good, you know, listening mix position, depending on as wide as you need it to be for your program. If it's just you, it could be narrow. If it's a commercial studio, you usually want it to be two people. Your choice. You have an easier and better shot at, at mixing accurately and correctly. Then do the work. You want to put flanging on a signal, that's that's your business. You want to put echo on a signal, that's your business. You want to pan from right to left that's the art of mixing that's the art of recording okay but the room needs to be a sort of a neutral palette it would be like you don't want the drill to do the drilling for you You, the drill is a tool you do the drilling yeah During the height of record making, the Spectra 1964 100 series preamp was the perfect choice to build consoles for Tom Dowd, Muscle Shoals, Stack Studios, Ardent Studios, and New York City record player. Bringing you the sound of ZZ Top, Aerosmith, Bruce Springsteen, King Crimson, John Lennon, and many more. The 100 series amplifiers offer extremely stable high-speed circuit design with unequaled headroom, low noise, and linear output, irrespective of transient audio peaks, giving you cleaner, punchier, dynamic dynamic recordings. The Spectra 1964 legacy is carried on today through Bill Cheney and Jim Romney. Now you can get that same incredible sound in your studio with the STX Mic Breeze, BBDI, and Comp Limiters. Go to Spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. You're hearing my voice right now on the Jay-Z BB29 microphone, the Spectra 1964 STX100, and C610 Comp Limiter. A gold bar should be kept safe in a vault because it's valuable, but it could be replaced if it was ever lost. One of your songs or recordings, on the other hand, is worth more than gold because it's one of a kind. It's you, and if it was ever lost, it could never be replaced. So wouldn't you feel better knowing your music was safe? This is why I like to have a dedicated system drive, audio work drive, virtual instrument storage drive, cloud storage, and an extra large backup drive in my studio computer. And when I'm finished with the project, I move it onto a dedicated pair of external drives for archiving. Thanks to OWC, I can count on my drives being super fast, reliable, and secure so that I can work quickly and sleep soundly at night knowing my music is safe. I want your music to be safe too. Discover the best options for storage and backup for your studio from OWC at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I've been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with the set it and forget it simplicity that lets you focus on your creativity in the studio while you let Isotope handle the audio challenges. If you've ever wanted to truly feel like a magician in the studio, then Isotope RX is your magic wand. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars in the show notes and use the code ROCK10 to get an additional 10% off your first purchase. Um, okay, cool. We'll, we'll keep moving forward. So, uh, um, thank you for sharing studios about Electric Lady. That answered a question we had from Chad Brown. And then we did get another one. This is from uh, Chuck Dembecki. And I, I don't know if it's quite a question. He just said calculations for live space and studio mixing room, math equations, exclamation point, triple. I'm not sure what that means, but it does remind me 
<laughs> that, to ask the question about like live space versus studio room, which you started to talk about already. And I wondered if there was more you wanted to say about, um, you know, the context for most of us listening is the home studio environment. So our audience is no, going to be a lot of I, people with that. I, you're right. It's not a question, but I have a feeling, I, I think I know where he, where he wants to go with the conversation. So we'll call it a title. Great. Okay. And so taking the lead from his conversation title, mixing environments, i.e. control room and recording environments, i.e. live room. These are, these, these are two different spaces. They may be exactly the same size, but if you think about it, they're, they're designed to do two different things. It would be like trying to put adjectives on the, front, on the driver's seat in the car and the back seat of the car. They're both seats. They both could be leather. They both are in the car, but they need to do different things. Okay? The back seat does not have to have infinite amounts of adjustments so that you can see over the steering wheel, whereas the front one does. And of course, I could keep going on and on. So different things are taking place in these two different rooms, okay? In the live room, the room where there's microphones, and of course, it gets more complicated when you put a microphone in the control room, but in what you and I would call the studio room or the live room, there I think you want to pay attention more to decay rate or reverb time. And uh, and even in smaller rooms, a lot of people will make the argument that you can't have reverb time in smaller dead rooms. I don't want to get into that debate. You still can have a decay. Okay. And um, RT60, which is the classic calculation, I think you're going to see more RT30 and RT20 as time goes on. But Interesting. we're getting into some weeds here that's unnecessary. So I think what this person is referring to is for those kinds of calculations, you need a little bit of math, but it's not particularly complicated. It's, it's pretty well-known stuff. It's been around a long time. Um, and, and essentially it starts to describe the target amount of absorption, or in most instances, the target amount of non-absorption. Actually, when you start really rolling up your sleeves and getting into design, you'll see that what you really are calculating is where you don't want absorption. Right. Most people make rooms too dead because they get confused. They clap their hands, they hear a flutter echo, and they start putting foam. They put, start putting fuzzy stuff on the walls, and you're going backwards. All, you, all you're doing is knocking out mid frequencies. You're not doing anything at low frequencies. You're actually now causing more disparage behavior between highs and lows. And you're going backwards when, in fact, you could accomplish the same thing by just angling a wall. Right, putting the fuser, et cetera, and keeping the keeping the decay rate high, keeping the naturalness high. In a control room, we're not ter- we're not as interested in the decay rate, and we're more interested in the universal the the universality or the relative evenness of the frequency response and the time domain response in a critical mix position. So it's a different kind of requirement, uh, and it's a different kind of math. The control room. Metrics, I think, have a lot less mass and have a lot more geometry and intuition and architecture. Live rooms, of which there's an infinite number of live rooms, there's, there's no speaker placement, there's, any shape can be a live room. There we lean a little bit more to mass and a little bit more towards vibe. There's no right or wrong. Okay? And so a lot of times when we start designing a live room, we, we don't pay much attention to acoustics. We might, we pay more attention to where's the door, where's the glass, um, do we need lighting, uh, do we need a fish tank, trees, views, lighting grids, storage, do we need how many ISO booths, and the, the, you know, and so those kinds of things, we start to get those into the puzzle, It's kind of like putting the edges of a puzzle. And start to build a room. And then at a certain moment, say, okay, we, the, the, we got enough of this picture now. Now let's start taking a look. Okay, so now we have a volume. Okay, the room's about this big. It's 600 feet, 800 square feet. It's going to be about 14 feet high, 12 feet high. Now we can start to get a volume. Once we start to get a volume, we can start to go to lookup tables or experience. After all, lookup tables are experience. And we can start to get target reverb times across an entire frequency range, as well as a reverb time graph. The bigger the room, the less you want the low frequency to rise up, which is what tends to happen. 
You want that low frequency to stay f- reverb time to stay flat or even roll down. Mm. I think this I follow you. When You're I measured RCA Studios before they turned it down, the great RCA Studios in New York. And to the, and this is why elect this is what is the magic of Electric Lady. I've measured Electric Lady a dozen times. And it's the ceiling that's doing the work. It's not the river. It's not Jimmy's poster. It's not the colored mural. They're all cool. I love those things. It's fantastic. It's the ceiling because the ceiling is a giant membrane absorber. So if I follow you correctly, when you're talking about the low, you don't want the lows to rise up. What you're describing no, you is... you want that in a concert hall, but, you, but just, you want that to stay flat or even tail off. But just to, to, to help describe it for, for the rock stars, um, it's this idea that you don't want the amount of time that sound is hanging out in the space, reverb time. On a you frequency don't want it to type. hang out longer at the low frequency. Yes, you okay, want gotcha. it to be just the opposite it, as the rooms get bigger. So a lot of our more current rooms, if you were to look at Jungle Studios, and yeah, I said when we were when we were done, if you want to, when you review your notes, if you want me to send some photos that could go into a link, I'm happy. Sure, um, yeah. If, if you look at the Berkeley Live Room, which is one of our really better rooms, those ceilings, which look very cool and they're splayed and they have angles and there's colors and whatnot, but what they are is membrane absorbers. They're actually thin plywood. They're low frequency absorbers. They're also high frequency scattering elements. I'm not a fool. I'm not going to make them parallel to the wood floor because that's a flutter echo. Right. But they're low frequency targeted membrane absorbers, to, not to be confused with velocity absorbers. Velocity absorbers are fluffy stuff like foam, right? insulation, curtains, stuff that changes en- acoustic energy to heat. Right. However, right. velocity absorbers, as, as you start to see the specs on them going down in frequency, they become very inefficient. Go to any foam manufacturer and go pull up the specs. They go, look at, go look at 63 hertz. Well, the first thing you'll notice is they usually don't even give you 63 hertz. They start at 125. It, they're not lying. It's just, it's not doing anything at 63 hertz. 120 for, 125 hertz might be 0.1, 0.15. It's basically ineffective. So you want to know why you go into an ISO booth, put up a lot of foam, and the bass guitar sounds like mud. Right. It's because you didn't do anything at 60 hertz. You, you just didn't do anything. You did a lot of work at 4,000 hertz, but nothing at 60 hertz. Now, are there any tricks that you can go try out to do yes. something at 60 from that, you know, easily? Absolutely. You could, you could hold the foam off the wall using the lambda over four rule, but you're going to have to start holding it off a big distances, or you could shift your thinking and use membrane absorbers. Membrane absorbers absorb by changing pressure. So what's an example of a membrane absorber? A Helmholtz resonator. Okay, and the advantage of membrane absorbers is that they can become extremely efficient, but only use four or five or six inches. This is very useful in small rooms, and we already discussed this. Most studios are now small. So you want to use, it would be like painting a painting and you're only using red. I mean, I, I guess you can, you know, we, you, could, you could paint the portrait only using red, and that might be an interesting exercise, but it might be more realistic and more interesting if you could use other colors. So we try to sure. use a balance. So the membrane that right now, the most exciting thing in our world, and I think one of the most exciting thing for acousticians is really fine tuning the membrane absorber universe. Number of companies are making off the shelf products. Some work better than others. Some of them are voodoo. Not all of them test as accurately as others. I don't want to get into that. I, I don't want to go any further than that right now. We know everybody who makes this stuff. We, we have our own thoughts on it. Uh, and, and we're also starting to, it may be the first moment where we adventure into a product. Right on. We have stayed, I have meticulously been product agnostic my entire life. We don't sell products. We don't sell equipment. We understand products and we understand the equipment and we have our favorites and we have stuff that we try to stay away from, but we don't sell it. Well, I want, I want someone else to sell it. <laughs> can I ask you this in the context of kind of the DIY home studio world? Um, for example, I know that there are some things that we could measure with our iPhone, for example, but when we're 
treating a space, you, you know, you described it, you say you go put a bunch of foam up. In other words, those are some things that we can do to begin to understand how things will affect the sound and the reverb um, in the space we're in. Are there any kind of DIY things that you yes. can do to try out a Helmholtz resonator or something Absolutely. just to hear what it sounds like? You know? Absolutely. Well, you can do two things. You can buy prefabricated membrane absorbers from companies. Um, uh, RPG makes some. The, the, the RPG products are tested and accurate. Um, Arithmetic, their products are tested and accurate. Pretty, pretty, pretty much their company out of Colorado. Um, Vicoustics, reasonably accurate, I think. Um, and you can DIY, DIY it yourself. It's, I mean, the formula for making a resonator is well known. It's been known for 100 years. Um, but, you know, you take your chances. I mean, if you do the calculation, you could be wrong in your calculation. You could use the wrong insulation. Different insulations have different, riot, what's called a rial spec. I think is what the term is. So basically a, a, resist, a, a, re, a resistance flow unit. So not all insulations behave the same. You could have somebody like us give you the design of it, and then you could go build it yourself. We've had many projects like that, particularly in the third world environments. They, they don't know how to make a resonator, but they know how to rip wood and make holes. Right, right. And um, so, Yeah. Are there things that we can do, again, just to begin to experience like uh, how to discover these things, like these frequency problems? Will sure. the iPhone, for example, do, help us understand sure. some of the low-end issues? Let's do some experiments that people could do so that they could get smarter. So let's talk about how someone can instantly learn what a comb filter is and what it does. Okay, so 10,000 people have small consoles. They don't even have to have big consoles, and they put those near fields right on the speaker bridge. And I guarantee you, you're going to get a comb filter. Direct sound out of the speaker, a bounce off the, off the faders, back up to you, probably a change in de the delta is maybe two or three feet. Basically, three feet is approximately three milliseconds, 1.1. Okay, uh, you know, 1.1 millisecond per foot, but let's round it off. Take that speaker, put it on a stand, move it back one foot. Just move it back and lower it just so it clears the bridge. Comb filter will disappear 50, 60, 70, 80%. You're going to hear the difference in 10 seconds. And you're never again going to put the speaker back on the bridge. Guarantee. Done it a million times. So there's an example of a, of, of a comb filter okay, uh, experiment. Let's do another experiment. How many people, they got a room and you end up sitting right in the middle of the room. I mean, you're in the middle of the room. There's nothing you can do. You're in a null. You're always going to be in a null. I don't care what you put in the corners and how much you're, you're in a null. Move one, move one foot forward or one foot back. Tell me if you hear a difference. Yeah. I'm standing in the middle of my room right now. <laughs> well, there's no way you can possibly have an accurate mix there. Doesn't mean you can't make music. Doesn't mean you can't write, you know... Uh, you know, the famous Ahmed Erdogan moment, they, they asked Ahmed, you know, had you form Atlantic Records and become the person you were? And so he, he looked at the person and he, he kind of started bouncing around. He, he just sort of bumbled around like he was stumbling. And the person said, I, I just don't understand. Can you do that again? So he did it again. He's just like bumbling around. And the person said, I, I don't get it. What does this mean? He says, I just stumbled into Aretha Franklin. <laughs> so, you know, none of this means you can't write an amazing song. But if you move up a foot or a foot and a half, hey, look at all that low frequency energy that was there. It was always in the room. It's just not in a null. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or if you just don't have any idea what to do and there's some low frequency problem, just take anything that's fluffy and put it in the corners. Pillows. Put your mother in the corner because corners are where the buildups are going to be the most. Because pressure absorbers want to absorb where the pressure is highest. So where's the pressure going to be the highest in a room? It's probably going to be at the boundaries. Yeah. Velocity is the lowest, pressure is the highest. Corner is going to be the intersection of two or even three surfaces. Okay, that's why these uh, you see some of the foam companies, they make you know corner absorbers, you know, they kind of have these kind of cool names. Right. It's just foam that's built out. 
Okay. Yeah. You know, so these are sort of the DIY tricks. They, they, they're seat of the pants. They're not calculated, but at least it, I, I would like to think of them more as experiments rather than solutions. Yeah. Well, you know, you're talking about the moving around with your speakers and, um, it makes sense, and to hear you t- describe it, sometimes it sounds like a little bit of a subtle thing that you need an ear for. But honestly, all, all we ever have to do is just like stand five feet away from a speaker and then just walk up to the speaker. Does it sound different to you? Well, then it's going to sound different depending where where you are, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, uh, try not to get the speakers too high. Try to keep them at ear level. There's there's virtually no excuse. To not have symmetry and not have ear level monitoring. Yeah. As the speakers go up, you have more and more risk of console bounce. All right. It's just, uh, it's just geometry. PreSonus has everything you need for your music or podcast production. Studio One is a great choice for your DAW, whether you are writing songs, creating EDM and pop music, recording bands, mixing, mastering, composing for film, or recording voice, and producing a podcast of your own. A flexible sketch pad, chord charts, key recognition, effects pedals, amp simulators, virtual instruments, including a killer drum machine, built-in vocal tuning with Melodyne, and 37 fantastic sounding plugins for mixing will allow you to create whatever inspires you. PreSonus provides you everything you need for your studio from microphone to digital interface to headphones and speakers so that you can easily set up your home studio for professional production. Get started now with the low-cost Studio One artist and join PreSonus Sphere for access to all their software, a complete learning library, and creative collaboration in the community at PreSonus, wherever sound takes you. If your goal was to climb Mount Everest, you would hire a Sherpa to guide you to the summit. If you wanted to sail around the world, you would hire a seasoned sea captain for a safe voyage. And if you wanted to try skydiving, you wouldn't just jump out of an airplane without being strapped to an expert, right? So why would you send off your mix for mastering without knowing that it was ready first? Wouldn't it be great to have a professional mastering engineer with a trained ear to guide you through the final stages of mixing? Brian Murphy is your trusted guide at soundporter.com home of the iterative mastering process, where you get to interact with a professional mastering engineer who listens to what you want and will give you mix feedback to help you get your mix ready for mastering. Contact Brian now for a free mix review and mastering demo so that you can hear it before you buy it at soundporter.com. Let me start asking you some questions about studio design for for the home uh, studio and or home or pro. Um, what what to you are some of the most I'm glad commonly that you, that you threw that in? Because the only difference between home and pro is that one's in a home and one's not. Right. I, I know. The, the line in the sand. It well, if anybody knows this, it's you in the, in Nashville, right? I mean, and by the way, kudos for that. Great moment a few weeks ago. With yeah, the, thank you, thank you. It yeah. only took twenty years, right? Or whatever. Uh, no, it took five years. So, rock stars, um, John's um, congratulating us for winning the home studio battle here in Nashville, and um, we're very excited. So, you uh, were uh, you you were a big deal in that, right? I mean, you were. Yeah, amazing. I basically led the charge um, for the entire well, the entire thing, and so. I mean, of all the cities. To, to to put to to put up resistance to that, you would have not guessed it would have been Nashville. But I know, I know. Well, I know. <laughs> but we won. We got it. So Great. we're moving on. And, and there's a lot of people who are really happy and a lot of people are excited send, to start putting their invoice. studio together. Now you can send an invoice. <laughs> all right. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, all right. So question. Um, what are some of the what do you feel like are some of the most commonly overlooked issues before starting a home studio or just a studio build? I think I think that answer is, um, for me, it's simple. I think most mistakes for most studio designs are made in programming. People do not get their programming thought out in the, in the first moment of their project. What, is, what does that uh, mean? What is programming? They just do not think thoroughly enough about what they're trying to accomplish. Marketplace. They go right to equipment because everybody goes to equipment quickly because everybody, because it's easy. Also, the, the equipment people drive our industry. They pay the most for ads. They support the magazines. 
equipments are at the trade show. You know, I mean, how many acoustic talks do you go to at the trade show? A few. How many equipment vendors do you walk around and see? Hundreds. You know, so, you know, here's an, here's an interesting experiment. Call up a commercial studio of any known value and ask them to, ask them to send to you or rattle off their microphone compliment. No problem. Oh, they'll give that to you right down to the S57. Then ask them for the volume of Studio A. The secretary might say, can you spell that volume? What, what, do, you, what do you want to know? The volume? Really loud. That's what really saying. loud. Yes, really loud. So I think that kind of talks to my, to my point. Okay. I don't even want to know what they'd say if you asked them for the reverb time chart. I mean, they, you know, they, but why shouldn't you have a right to know that? I mean, so if we want to, you're renting. if we want to answer that question ourselves for our home studios, I mean, obviously just like it's basic arithmetic, um, it's just ceiling height, oh. width and length and, and get a well, rough idea, right? All, you don't, you don't need to answer that. I need you. Okay. So there's a translation coefficient. Okay. Um, it, it's like there's programming and then there's the code that goes to, to computer code. You don't have to know that second one. Okay. Other people do. So I, if we're doing a project for J. Cole, which we did, I'm not going to ask J. Cole what his target reverb time is for his, for his studio. He, he's, he's, he says, well, that's what I'm paying you to tell me. But I am going to ask J. Cole how many musicians he wants to record what kind of music he wants to record. Okay. How loud do you think you're going to go? So I know how much isolation I need. So I don't disturb his wife on the third floor of his home. Okay. Now he's not going to be able to give me that in decibels, but he could turn his, but he can turn his monitor system up and tell me how loud he's going to play that he can do. Or I can go meet him at electric lady one day where he's working all summer. Okay. Is this as loud as you're going to get? Yeah. I, I never really work louder than this. Okay, now I, I'll get the number. Okay, so you ask the question that gets you the right answer. Yeah, this is all programming, including what kind of console do you want? How many people do you want in your control room? You know, do you need to store twenty guitars? Do you want to have a palm tree in the room? And I mean, whatever, whatever the program is, whatever you think is interesting to describe. Okay, as opposed to I want to make a cool studio in my house. I mean, okay, you want world peace as well? I mean, that's okay, but that's not enough to work with. And that's how people get off track. By the way, what's your budget? And don't tell me you want to do it as inexpensively as possible. Everybody wants to do it right, as inexpensive. Right. That's, that's not going to work, okay? And so we got to suck out the program. So our first job, besides acquisition of the project and client education, that's our first two jobs, client education is to suck out all the bits and pieces of information so we get a program. So particularly with isolation, because most of the money, if you need, if you need serious isolation, that's where most of your money is going. If you don't need serious isolation, what would be an example? Well, I'm building a studio in the basement of my house and I'm the only one in the house. So I don't really need to isolate it. I'm, there's no one to isolate it from and my house is 150 feet from another house and I only work during the day and I don't really work that loud at night and it's in the basement and I'm okay. Well, that changes everything. For starters, not only don't I not have to spend money on isolation, it means that the boundaries of my room are now thin. When I say thin, I mean relatively thin compared to massive sheetrock. Mm -hmm. That means that the boundaries of my space can now, will now begin to act membranically so they themselves will begin to become low frequency absorbers and when i put it into our calculation formulas our our our, our niro uh uh program we can we're going to change the impedance of the boundaries whereas if you need heavy isolation you need thick walls you need heavy heavy duty walls which is of course traditional with a with an impedance almost at zero point five 0.05, very, very low. That changes everything. Now, the, where's the low frequency go? Can't go anywhere. Has to stay in the room. Right. What's it going to do? I got to absorb it. So you start to see how these, all these issues spiral and, and snowball. They, 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 they become a snowball 
In fact, we got to know them. We got to suck out that information from our client while still basically speaking in their terms. Different clients have different um, thresholds of, of engagement. Um, some are interested in this. Some are not. Some are interested in it, but you kind of lose them when the first technical term goes out or the first math. Very few of them want to follow the math. Some of them are pretty, you'd be surprised. Some, some have really surprised me. Um, we've, got, we've been really blessed. We're, and particularly in the last 10 years, um, we, we, we're really, um, we're very, very fortunate that we get really, really cool clients. We're, as I said, we generally speaking are oversubscribed, so we can kind of choose our clients. And, and it, it doesn't always mean the biggest jobs or, or even the most expensive jobs. We're not even considered the most expensive people. Um, we know what everybody else charges. Um, we, we just need the right, the right uh, uh, arrangement of, of, of site, client, time frame, uh, learning curve. We love projects where there's a high learning curve. Uh, education is really critical. And, and we've been very fortunate. We get to work with some cool artists. I mean, you know, when you're working with artists, you don't mind making less money because they're, because they're cool. They yeah. inspire us. They, they change our lives. I mean, we, I worked with Harry Connick. He changed my life. And he's remained not a close friend, but a casual friend. And it's, it's inspiring to hang out with him. That's cool. Are there any um, uh, any of your clients' names we might recognize right off the bat that are the ones that you remember surprising you with how much they really wanted to get into the details of stuff? You know, Jack Antonoff is a detail guy. Believe it or not, he has a li- he's good for about eight minutes sometimes. <laughs> I mean, they all they all have their minutes. Yeah, um, that's great. Bruce was extremely quiet during our studio conversation. Just listened, didn't say anything, but you knew he was taking it all in. And then... That's Bruce is in the boss? Yeah, that Bruce. And then at the end of the meeting, we just stood there. The meeting was a standing meeting. We kind of went over some things that he needed in his New Jersey studio. Uh, His wife actually was running most of the details, Patty. And then uh, the meeting kind of ended. And... Everybody, I don't know, she had to do something and the builder went somewhere else. And I, I sort of saw myself standing next to him for a few extra minutes. I said, you know, I, it was nice to meet you. I'd never met him in person. Huge fan, of course, like all of us. I said, you know, a few weeks ago I was in Vegas and it was two in the morning and I was channel surfing. And I don't know, I came across a you with a Roy Orbison something or other that you were doing some kind of fundraising something or other. Totally different Bruce. Could not stop him from talking about it. <laughs> it's like now, now he's engaged. Now he just wanted to talk about the music. That's great. Just wanted to talk about the music. His engineer, on the other hand, whose name I forget, he's worked with a few engineers. Very detailed. The secret to a great mix is to start with great source tracks. And this means you need great microphones. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia brings you the new BB29 Signature Series microphone to help your recordings add clarity and detail to your mixes. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design with a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity without distracting colorations and distortions. The new BB29 microphone has a Class A discrete amplifier fire circuit, extremely low self noise and transformer coupled output to bring an expensive sound to your studio for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five year warranty, free shipping to the US and a 30 day money back guarantee. Plus for a limited time, you can use the coupon code ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the BB29 at jayzmike.com. The legendary API sound can be described as punchy and bold with a distinct in-your-face presence. For more than 50 years, API Audio has been advancing their design of consoles, mic preamps, compressors, and EQs. But what API founder Saul Walker got perfect in the very beginning were the proprietary op amp and transformer designs. And today, API still offers the very best for your studio with dedicated rack units for mic pre, EQ, and compression, and consoles from small to large with the 
Fox 1608 2448 or full size Legacy Access, and they even introduced the original 500 series lunchbox to studios everywhere. But most importantly of all, no matter which gear you choose from API, you can count on the original op amps and transformer designs to make sure you always get that legendary API sound. Because the next record you make could be your best record ever. Visit apiaudio.com. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Want to start mastering your own records? Rockstars of Mastering walks you through exactly how I mastered my own record using nothing but plugins and pre-sona Studio One. Want to learn how to create a mix that doesn't suck but rocks instead? At Mix Master Bundle, I show you how to mix using stock and free plugins so that you can have punchy, powerful drums, guitars that rock, bass you can feel, and a mix that is in your face. Plus, it's totally free as my way of saying thanks for listening. Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now and look for the clickable link in the show notes below. All right, so now you must have an experience as a, as a fan of music. You must have an experience of having designed a studio, and then there's that moment where you get to hear the first record that comes out of it. Do you have any stories about that and about how that has blown you away when you've heard a, something recorded in one of your spaces and it just you, puts a smile on your face? It's happened a lot, to be honest. We, a, lot of, a lot of music's been recorded in, in studios we've designed. I believe um, on your YouTube channel, I, I feel like there was a recent iPhone video of an orchestra yeah. recording. Yeah. Um, we, I, the ones that excite me the most are the orchestra recordings. Um, I always love hearing Eddie's drum sounds at Electric Lady. I mean, we designed Electric Lady Studio specifically to get a very, very big drum sound for Eddie. I mean, it, Eddie was the chief engineer. So in a sense, kind of almost co-designed it with me, Eddie Kramer. Um, and to this day, you know, that the drum sound that he gets, I think it's based on those moments. Um, I, I, I don't have one okay, in, all right. in particular. I, I have had moments when we've gotten a call from either an artist or, or a particular client that have been more exciting than others. I mean, when Leon Russell called, I mean, I'm a keyboard player growing up in the 60s. So Leon Russell, for me, was God. Yeah. Was God. And when I got a call to do his studio in his basement in his Tulsa home, and this was not that long after Electric Lady, to me, this I said, I cannot believe this is actually going to happen. Flew to Tulsa. He picked me up personally. Um. I, I've also had some embarrassing moments because I got a call one day from um, from Rick Okasik of the Cars. He wanted me to do his studio. They were they were they had just acquired some space on on uh, on uh, Boylston, right around the corner from Berkeley, and they wanted a studio to do their next album, which became that iconic album, the Cars, and. Um, he, I'll have to admit, I, I actually didn't know who the cars were. I knew the song, but I right. didn't know it was the cars. Okay, how you doing? Very nice to talk to you. And so can you come up and, and take a look at the space? I said, sure. No, no, we worked out the small business thing. It wasn't that complicated. And at the time, I was flying. I was a pilot. So I said, you know, I'm going to fly my plane up and land at the private airport. He says, great, I'll pick you up. I, I said, well, how am I going to know it's you? He says, you're going to know it's me. He's six six, <laughs> you, yeah, you know. Yeah. How it, he says, believe me, you're going to know it's me. He said, great. I said, so how's it going with the cars? How are you guys doing? He says, we're doing pretty well. Um, do you have you? Uh, do you come to New York at all? He says, we were just in New York last week. I said, great. Where did you play? He said, the Garden. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. So now, from now on, when people call, I usually. If, if I get that kind of a call, I'm like texting with my son. <laughs> yeah. All the young people in my office said, you ever hear of Timbal Timbaland? You ever hear? That's great. Call? I, you know, so, I mean, I'm a little, you know, I'm older now, but um, it's, it, it's surprising. Some of the cool stuff that that's out there. Um, 
working with Jack Antonoff's been been a joy. He's he's brilliant. He's really good at what he does. He, and and his engineer Laura. Um, got to do some projects with Harry Connick, who's been around my entire life. Uh, not Harry Connick, Herb Alpert. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some artists. You know, you're a service provider. Um, working with Alicia was through Alicia, by the way, Alicia Keys. You're really working with Annie Mincielli. Annie is her engineer. Uh, Alicia is uh, much more technical than you would expect. She's actually quite technical. And of course, Annie is one of the great engineers in America. And not female engineers, great engineers, period. And so, you know, those are those are really cool moments. And you can drive down the technology avenue as, as much as you want with her. I mean, she'll, I don't know if Annie can do a reverb time calculation, but she certainly understands where we're going with that as a concept. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. It's very cool. Well, it's so, so you talked about, um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, the drum sounds with Eddie and I wondered if we could just ask you, what are some important design considerations for our studios for recording drums? What's the kind of stuff we should be thinking about well, for making drums? Once again, once again, programming. So in Nashville, I expect every studio to have four or five ISO booths, very dead, very tight, because there's a long history of putting drummers in basically stuffy, small environments, and that's the sound they want. That's okay. But Eddie Kramer would, in a million years, would never do it. He just wouldn't even go to that studio. He'd put everybody else in those rooms and put the drums out in the big room, okay, with a high mic and then his his uh, assortment of mics, of which, to be honest, I don't know what they are, but I, he's been pretty forthcoming with them because he's often a guest on my, uh, I teach an online course in mm-hmm. design, and usually for the last segment, it's a 12-week course, uh, by then, everybody's handed in their term paper, and I usually try to have a guest. And I've had Eddie on a few times. I've had Bob Margoloff, the great Stevie Wonder producer, on as a guest. Um, and Eddie's, Eddie's quite forthcoming with his mics. I don't know if he gives out every little trick. But if you want a big drum sound, you you got to have a big room. I mean, got to have a big room. Yeah, and you also mentioned something that I feel like is um, another key element that I had to learn um, when when I was considering like the Glenn Johns drum miking, yeah, it's this yeah. idea of of um, few mics and and you have to get away from the kit. And if you're going to get away from the kit, you can't be you can't be getting away from the kit and even closer to a wall or a ceiling. You know, you got to no. have a room where that's that can breathe. You got to have a room. You got to know where to place that mic, and then you have to know how much to mix that guy in with the other mics. Yeah, and that's it. He's you know he's. He's one of the guys that got pretty good at it. <laughs> now, very- what about for, um, and what what have you learned? So I don't want to put you on the spot for the recording tech too much, but um, as far as the best space of the room for uh, acoustic bass or even a bass amp, um, what are some things that you've learned from people and from designing? I, I, I can't tell you, but I've watched a lot of guys do it. The, the, the most common one seems to be a combination of acoustic and direct. And they bring them up on two faders and they mix them. Direct is direct. Yep. And to be honest, I, most of the time I see people take the bass amp and throw it into a into a pillow or a gobo or a room. Okay, all right. I I can't remember the last time I saw somebody putting a bass amp in the middle of a big room. What about for upright bass? I'm not saying it hasn't been done. For- but you're 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 really interviewing the wrong guy for that. Okay, all right. <laughs> Well, I mean, I didn't mean for the technique. I just wondered if you had people saying, you know, I'm recording a lot of jazz with upright bass and it's got to sound great and and therefore yes. we need this okay. kind of space. So when we, yes, so when we did the studios for jazz at Lincoln Center, which is essentially Winton's rehearsal room, the, the control room was big, he wanted that room to be bright. He's got 20-person jazz orchestra and he does not want that and that room is not dead. Most of the panels are wood. Okay, so yeah, no, no, because because that room was built for a very specific purpose. Also, think about it. It's not hard to make a a bright room dead. It's hard to make a dead room bright. Right. I mean, I can make a bright room dead. I can have curtains. I can bring in rugs. I can bring in gobos. There's a lot of tricks that are not even particularly difficult. I can have doors that open and shut that give variable acoustics. Okay, but it's kind of hard to take a dead room that's way too dead, particularly if it's dead in an uneven manner. So 
mids and highs are dead, lows are not, and make it bright. What, what are you going to do? Bring in 20 pieces of plywood? I mean, think about it. Just mechanically, it's difficult. Yeah. So a lot of times when we are bi- on a bigger room where it's a multi-purpose room, in other words, it's a commercial studio, it has to be a lot of things to a lot of people. I try and design the room for its brightest use, for its most reverberant use, for its most acoustic use, and then introduce variable acoustics or other techniques, gobos, hinge panels, curtains, flipping panels on the ceiling with motors, we've, you name it, we've done it, that can lower the reverb time to the target or alter it on a frequency by frequency basis so that it then suits the needs more for a rock, for tighter Yeah, stuff. And, the, and you just described perfectly what we do in a DIY home studio exactly. situation. You take the big yeah, equity living room. Gobos. Yeah, exactly. Gobos exactly. and blankets in there. Yeah. Um, vocals. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've designed studios for Jay-Z. You've designed studios for uh, Alicia Keys. Um, different vocal styles. What, what, what advice do you have for a vocal space? What's appropriate for for you know, the studios, those studios are, are interesting because in both instances, the, the programming, uh, the notion of programming was very, very specific. Uh, uh, Alicia, mainly Annie, spent a lot of time defining what they were trying to accomplish. Jay-Z and his engineer, his name I forget right now, they basically wanted a tiny studio. They said, we, we don't need a big studio. We're, it's just one guy and a mic. Yeah. We talked them into, same with Timbaland. When we laid out Timbaland's studio in Virginia Beach, he says, I, I don't need a big studio. I just, you know, it's just me. I'm out there or one of my guys. And then I, I said, you know, let us make it a little bit bigger just in case you want to record five musicians. And of course, it saved the day on the studio. Okay. But in both cases, the lounge was bigger than the live room. Right. Okay. Because you don't make a big lounge and the lounge had windows into the live room because if you don't have a big lounge all those people are going to hang out and control them right right okay with guns <laughs> sometimes so <laughs> so it, so it's interesting those were instances where the lounge was like a really important part of the design it's just kind of kind of goofy and I, alicia i could be wrong about yeah. this but i picture timbaland as somebody who also likes to record real drums to create samples to build a I think track so. and stuff I think so. He doesn't engineer. He always sits in the back, at least when I worked with him. And Jimmy Douglas at the time was his engineer. He let Jimmy do the engineering and he'd sit in the back. So that's interesting. When you have a producer who works like that, you have to make a wide sweet spot. Right. You got to make sure that where he's standing is not too different than the engineering. It's going to be different, but you don't want it to be too different. He's ready to let Jimmy make the fine tune engineering moves, but you got to at least have make sure that in his position, which is more of a producer's position, okay, is is uh you know has a reasonable response. Yeah. It's similar. So that's again, that's the kind of thing that comes out when you start thinking about how you want to use your room. Um, now, when you go the other direction, you've got somebody who's a real powerful diva voice. Um, what what are some things that need to be considered for that kind of space? I don't know if there's anything super particular. I think. A lot of voices like that, they'll just pop them in the middle of a live room. I mean, I've I, I've seen I've seen Eddie, or I've seen Margoloff, I've seen other producers take a known vocalist and they'll put him in the vocal booth or behind Gobos at Electric Lady, and then others they'll put them right in the middle of the room. They'll put them right in the middle of the space. Maybe just surround them with some Gobos just to make sure there's no, no energy coming back. And I. I don't know why they're doing it. I think it depends on the mic. I, as I said, I my job, our job is to provide enough variations and enough flatness and accuracy, both in the live room and the control room, along with everything else that happens. Isolation, noise control, code, code compliance, lighting, mood, vibe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Technology, conduit runs. There's a lot of things in a studio. It's not just this acoustic issue that you're dwelling on. Our job is to provide the tool. Yeah. We're, we're after that. Now, it helps that about, about a third of our primary designers are also mixing engineers. Almost everybody that works for us is, is a musician of some sort, the, the designers. I mean, we have administration people, but um, they're like me. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a professional musician anymore. I still play piano, but, you know, we're all... We're all 
we, we all started as musicians. Yeah, well, they have an appreciation for what, what is needed in the studio space. I, I don't see how you can really do this if you don't love music and you don't have... Uh, I, don't, I, just, I don't think it makes any sense. What would be the point? I couldn't do this podcast if I didn't love music. <laughs> I mean, what are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to make the best sounding music and the most accurate music and get it delivered to the most amount of people. I mean, that's it's always been the goal. Everything else is... Is, is in the category of either business or tools. Yeah. I'm on the tool side. I've been fortunate in that I've been able to combine these passions, this architecture, technology, and acoustics, these three universes into something that is fun for me and has also afforded me a livelihood. I mean, I'm, a, I'm lucky. Yeah. I, it didn't start out that way. I, I gave you the story. I'm 22. I didn't know this was going to happen. That's I had no great. idea. What a great story. <laughs> Do you feel like the time you spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step -step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step -step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen, I appreciate you listening to this podcast, and I know you're trying to make your best record ever. But when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then you're ready for UltimateMixingMasterclass.com. You you let me know that uh that we're probably running near the end of our time here. So let me let me wrap up the questions. I, I have to say, I you threw you threw um yeah, you threw one or two questions in there I haven't heard before. <laughs> All right. I like to uh, thank you cool. for that. Um let me ask you this one tech question, just just so you can just if there's anything that people should know about it, uh it's it has nothing to do with sound. Well, it does have something to do with sound, but it's got nothing to do with where you put the mic. It's the H V A C question. What, what do the rock stars need to be thinking about when it comes to remembering that it has to be comfortable in there, just just generally speaking? And is that well, a mini split unit behind your head in the back there of the video? That is in the back of my video. Or is it just a shelf that I see in the distance? Let me see what my video looks like. Uh, I'm going to guess it's not, If you otherwise you'd say no, yeah. No, that's just the shelf, but, but that's a mini split up there. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I have in my studio. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Air conditioning is just climatized air. I mean, you, for instance, you know, you need, if it gets hot, you need cooling. If it gets cold, you need heating. Right. Most studios, particularly ones that are isolated, don't have to pay too much attention to heating because right. what you have to do to isolate them is you're basically making a thermos. So we don't, we don't, and, and, and a lot of people leave their equipment on all the time. So heating is usually not really an issue, but cooling is. And it can get complicated because sometimes you need to cool your room in a building where everybody else has heating. I mean, we've had situations where you need cooling in the winter. Yeah. So that's, that's an issue. HVAC, the biggest concern is noise. Okay. So quiet I think the, 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 the real issue is quiet HVAC. If you need HVAC that requires ducting, in other words, you need minimum fresh air exchange. So that would be any commercial project, any educational project, et cetera, et cetera. Now things get complicated very fast because now you have moving air, you have velocity limitations, air noise, ducts conduct, the duct work will conduct the sound from the machines along the path. You need silencers, line ducts. It gets complicated. Also, the ducts get bigger because in order to keep the velocity down, you need to make the ducts bigger in order to have the same amount of CFM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the other hand, if it's a home studio like your studio and like all these studios that now at last are legal, you don't need required air. You can just say, I'm opening my window, which of course you may never open. So you now don't need legally a ducted system, and you now have the option of a split ductless system. Used to be that they were really noisy. Good news is there's a few really, really quiet ones. 
Plus, you always have the option to control it. Okay. When it's time to record, just turn it off. Yeah. That's what, that's that's what I do. Recording. You're recording for five minutes. Turn it off for five minutes. Nothing's going to change in five minutes. And then turn it back on. And then in your control room, chances are the fan noise and everything else that's going on is going to basically be more than the unit anyway. And again, you do all your work. If there's a critical mixing moment and you think that that fan noise is maybe disturbing something that on the frequency you're working at, just turn it off for 30 minutes. That's fine. And there's thousands and thousands of smaller studios, particularly in the third world countries where we do a lot of work, that they've been using that system for years, but that's not going to work on a commercial studio. Right. It's illegal. Okay, great. Just like ramps. That's great. Okay, you can have a platform in your studio. You can have a step up. You can build a floating floor and open the door and have a step. You can't do that in a commercial studio. It's illegal. You need a ramp. Ramps require distance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge difference between just like we're trying to find out the isolation requirements because that's where the money is. Is this a commercial studio or is this a home studio? And I, I don't care how you make your money. I just want to know how it's categorized. Yeah. I, what, what, what you do for billing, that's, that's a business issue. Okay. If this is your private home studio that meets the home cottage industry specifications, you, you can have a step. Yep. You have, you can have two steps. You probably you might have two steps right now in your house, split level house, whatever. You can have a split ductless unit. That's fine. But you would not be able to do that in a school. Yeah. Well, John, that was a great, great answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me just ask the final closing one here. This one's hypothetical, but we're going to take the uh, studio way back machine and you're going to go way back and find young John who has uh, just been asked, I guess, to design his first club in New York City, perhaps or maybe earlier than that, and you're going to tap yourself on the shoulder and say, listen, dude, here I am from the future, and I want to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. Uh, and that would, of course, be studio designing. What advice would you like to go back and give yourself if you could? Well, I tipped my hat on the make your first project famous, um, but that's more of a career path answer. And I guess you did that one. Yeah, I I didn't know it was going to be famous, but it turned out it was famous. And uh, I was in it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've never uh, advice to, to someone who's building their studio, who wants to build a studio or. No, this is to advice go- to yourself. If you oh, could go back and give yourself son. advice. You, you got me stumped on this. I, I if, if I now were to give. 22 year old John, more advice. I would, I would, I would remind, I would say, try to be, try to listen more, talk less and be more patient. Um, I haven't always been so good with those. Um, I've been working on it. Particularly since I met Beth, um, I'd, that'd be, that'd be my, that'd be the 74 year old person advising the 22 year old person. That's great. What a great answer. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's an acoustic answer, but you, you said I could answer it any way I wanted no, to. No, it's perfect. John, um, thank <laughs> you. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. Um, we got to do the uh, the NAM yeah. panel virtually recently and then to do that this That was together. a lot of fun. I remember that. Yeah, it was cool. Um, yeah. How can the rock stars, how can they listeners find you and learn more about you online? Where would you like Easy them to, to go? Find, uh, just if you type my name in, it comes up. We have a webpage, wsdg.com. Pretty simple. Send me an email. I get, I love teaching. I love staying in touch with students. You can't send me an email that says, can you design my studio? Or, you know, you can't do that. I mean, you can't for free anyway. I, I have to have a life, but I like talking to people and learning. And if there are a few references that you think would be interesting to then tag along on however you're sending this out, just shoot me an email. I'll get you some photos and stuff. Absolutely. I will, for sure. Example of this. Do you have a, an example of that? Or I don't know, whatever. I don't know how you end up doing this. Yeah. But, and by the well, thank you. Thank you for doing this. It's a pretty cool service that you do. Oh, well, thank you, man. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, hey, look, I guess you heard that the NAM is virtual. They made they pulled the string on that. Yeah. You heard. yeah. yeah. They had no choice. They had no yeah. choice. We'll, we'll, be, we'll all be hanging out again in person before you know it. We will, but not in January in Anaheim. Nope. Yeah. 
Listen, well, stay safe and uh, uh, take, you know, take care of yourself. Make more mu- music and art is going to pull us out of this mess. That's what I tell everybody. Music and art. Indeed. And thanks for helping us, uh, the, the whole world, make better music and art. And, and thank you also to your wife, Beth, for um, yeah. <laughs> accommodating us through this. The waving in the background. Yeah, there she is. All right. All right. She is. You don't want to say hello in person, Beth. Oh, yep. There she is. She's there in the distance. I don't know. There. Okay, That's good. The other brilliant hat. I don't know what design, what it, but it sure smells good. I'm about to jump to it. Thank you. All See right. You. Thanks so much, John. Cheers. Okay. Thank you very much for all this. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rockstar i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who helped make this episode possible. OWC, Presonus, API Audio, Isotope, Sound Porter Mastering, Jay-Z Microphones, and Spectra 1964. You will find links to all these wonderful sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio, and they're going to help you make your best record ever. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.